friends, and welcome back to your weekly Linux talk show. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. And my name is Brent. Hello, gentlemen. Well, coming up on the show today, it is the end of my 65-day challenge of dropping the iPhone, dropping Google, and saying goodbye to Apple. Were the free software solutions good enough? Stay tuned and find out. Plus, we have got some great picks, some boosts, some feedback, and a lot more that we'll be rounding the show out with. So before we go any further, let's say good morning to our friends over at Tailscale. Go to tailscale.com. That's a mesh VPN protected by WarGuard. And man, is it slick. My next cloud's on Tailscale. My image system's on Tailscale. All my, all my stuff. Jellyfin, all of it now. No longer on the public internet. No more inbound firewall ports for me. I love it. It's going to change your game. Go over there. Tailscale.com. And then let them know we sent you somehow. Because we don't have a URL. So just go to Tailscale.com. Let them know we're there. You know? And before we go any further... Let's say time appropriate greetings to that mumble room. Hello, virtual lug. Hey, everybody. Hello, Hello. 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 And we have we have a whole other like echelon up in the quiet listening up there as well. Just fantastic. So nice to have everybody there. We're going to talk a little bit about mumble today, actually. We're kind of in a unique position where all three of us hate talking about the show on the show. It's just, there's so many other things we could talk about. Right. And it's just not particularly what we want to spend our time doing, but we also have a really good problem. And that is the show has grown tremendously in the last year, starting around April and specifically in November and December, we've seen tremendous growth. And, um, we thought maybe we should touch on a few things that we kind of toss out there all the time on the show. We kind of mention a matrix room or we'll mention mumble. Yeah. What is that matrix room? I've been trying to figure it out. Matrix. That sounds like something you sleep on. And the reason why we want to spend a little time talking about is because all of these are free software projects that we dog food. You know, we eat our own dog food on this stuff and we gain experience running these things at scale with the world's largest Linux podcast audience. And it integrates into our coverage here on the show, but it also it's just kind of like it's they're great accessories to the show and it's a great community to participate in. And so there's a lot of newcomers that we felt like we should bring up to date kind of at the beginning of the year. And we can kind of point back to this. And then later on, I do want to do my graph drafting OS update. See if it's stuck or not. Or, uh, you know, I think it's a worrying sign that you can't remember the name of the project. Mm-hmm. Like maybe you've been dialing back with the iPhone. Uh-oh. Don't you think it's a worrying sign that I have these AirPods in my ears right yeah, now too? Well, I mean, I... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, before we before we get to that, though, let's take a moment and uh, let's talk about this little podcast. that's nearly at 500 right now, just a few weeks away. And let's start with Mumble. Mumble is our virtual lug and, and Mumble is an application that is open source and it uses Opus audio. So it's a really high quality and it's really low latency. And we have had, I think, since episode one, Mumble on. And it's been, you know, the dumbest idea I ever had that worked out great. <laughs> you know, don't you guys think like, here's an idea. Let's every single week, let's do a Linux podcast on the internet live, live, no, no sensor, no beeps <laughs> where anyone in the world can join our mumble room and hang out with us and say whatever they want. And we have a couple of ground rules in there and folks like mini Mac help us make it possible where it's like, we check your audio. We make sure it's, you know, you got headphones and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Understand that we are trying to do a live show and that's it. And we're at 500 episodes, almost 495 episodes. And it's just been some of the best contributions uh, that you could expect. I mean, beyond what you could expect, I think just been incredible. And if I would have told you like in a, in a business meeting where we, you know, where we, where we worked at a corporation where we were planning our content as part of a meeting. And I said, I want to bring in internet randos live and I'm going to jack them right into the, into the, in right into the, to the mixer. And put them, and I'm going to have them on a record track, and anything they say is going to go into the show. They would have rejected that idea right then and there. It's interesting too with Mumble because there's like, it's both um, a sort of a little barrier to entry because it's not quite as easy to get set up with and use as maybe your, you know, your Discords or the like. But the flip side is it's just been pretty darn reliable, and it doesn't change a bunch, right? Like we're not worrying about like, oh gosh, the Mumble direction's going to change. They're no longer going to have our use case in mind. And it's not like it's inactive. I was just looking. Their last commit was two weeks ago. They had a release back in September. So it's not like a busy project, but it's alive. Just where you'd like it, actually. 
You know, Chris, if you remember a few years ago, I, uh, I started connecting uh, to Mumble and that's kind of how my JB, let's call it my JB career started. But I remember that moment because I was in a, like an off-grid cabin on a holiday kind of. And I was like, I feel like <laughs> connecting to the Mumble room for the live show. And I did it like from a cell connection <laughs> in like this tiny cabin, off-grid cabin, which is memorable, but more so because, you know, that's where I got to hang out with a lot of the people that are still there today and and got me to be more involved in the show and to where I am sitting in the seat today as well. So I got to say, Mumble did it for me. I feel like when people try Mumble, they have one of those universe, universal experiences of, oh, I, I really enjoy chatting with other folks who know what I'm talking about. A lot of times in my daily life, people don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about Linux stuff or open source stuff. Or networking stuff, or whatever it might be, hardware stuff. And when I go to Mumble, they do know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but you get that little taste of uh, real-time interaction. Though. Yeah. It can be hard to come by. So jupiterbroadcasting.com slash Mumble for the info on that. And then Mumble itself is an open-source app that's probably, well, you can get it from their website, or you can get it as a flat pack or a Snapple, or you can get it um, through your, you know, distro. I don't know. I don't know how you Linux or what you're doing, all right? See, if you call them Snapple packages, I almost like them more now. I know. Right? I mean, I think they could use some love, bro. I think they could use it. Um, and then while we're on open source and uh, communities, we talk about Matrix a lot. And this is one where the show really had to go to school. Um, we did it on a Lark, set it up real quick. Synapse school. And then we discovered that Synapse, especially early Synapse, had some scaling issues. We also discovered that there was a community there and that we had to scale quick. And now we have it on like some 96 core monster on Linode. Uh, but it's a very active community. And uh, we use it for our live chat and our live streams right now we have title bots in there thanks to listener gamma that collect title suggestions and then we vote on them afterwards and kind of like a discord server or a slack server we have different rooms for different topics and so depending on what you're interested in or which show you follow we have different rooms we have linux unplugged rooms we have Coda radio rooms we have meetup locations and one area that we've recently rolled out that we wanted to make you aware of is we've added a jobs room. And uh, this is for people that have jobs or for people that are looking for jobs in our community. Because we've had people reach out that, are, that have positions they're trying to make people aware of, or we have people that have just recently lost work. And the chances are, if the person hiring or the person looking for a job are part of the Jupiter Broadcasting community, they're probably more qualified than 90% of your other candidates. And so we've already seen some success in this job room, guys. I don't know if you checked it out, but... Yeah, it's pretty great to see. bit.ly slash Jupiter Jobs. It's also just in our matrix space. But if you want to go right to it, it's bit.ly slash Jupiter Jobs. And that'll take you to the job board room where people are posting and looking. I've been impressed. There's already like 65 or so people in there and uh, tons of really interesting stuff has come by. I've sort of turned all the notifications on for this one because I was kind of curious to see where this would go. And uh, I got to say, it's been super active and the stuff that's been in there has been fascinating. If if I was in certain locations, like there's some European stuff that sounds fascinating and some stuff down in the US as well, but um, it's totally worth looking at. It's kind of like the hacker news jobs thing, but better. Also, shout out to uh, Dan Johansson, who has been in the Mumble Room every show for years now. Usually the first in there, almost always, like 99.9% .9 of the time, the first person in there, too. So Dan's in there again today, and Dan's boosting, too, these days. Dan, thank you so much for your contributions. It's always nice seeing you in there, too. You're welcome. Yeah, and, you know, like, what? We don't, we don't really want to go through all the work and the talking into the void if, if there's not people to like be here live with us right? it gives it an energy it's a lot and we have shows that are offline we get to enjoy both and i do enjoy both types of, of of shows um while we're kind of on things that are chat rooms we do also have a telegram group if that's your flavor i think what you just find that at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash telegram to get to that or you can just search around in there and we also have a new contact page that maybe we could spend a second here boys and talk a little bit about that because when you, when you go to the Jupiter Broadcasting contact page or you go to Linux Unplugged contact page, that goes into an inbox that all of us can see. Brent often is the one that's primarily watching that, though. Yeah, I'm sort of trying to get an idea of the threads after each show. Um, some shows we get tons of feedback, like the backup one we just had. Tons of feedback, really interesting, some great new ideas from listeners, and it expands our knowledge of the topic as well. So that's been always great. 
but sometimes it's just like random stories in there or like little tips of new tech that we hadn't even heard of. So all of that's amazing. And I, I would totally encourage everyone to, you know, if you have one of those like shower thoughts and you think we would like to hear it, send it on in. That's a great way to, to do it. So that's jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. Small correction here. Uh, you can just go to t.me slash Jupiter Broadcasting if you want to ah, join the uh, Telegram and uh, find a direct link to it at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash community. I forget about the t.me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. t.me slash Jupiter Broadcasting. Thanks. See, that's why it's nice having, having real time follow up. Um, yeah. All right. So just want to get that out there. The contact stuff is just kind of steaks and potatoes for you guys, but something probably to know about. Yeah, um, and we like, I mean, we like receiving them. There's a lot of fascinating stuff. Yeah. So please yeah. don't hesitate to reach out. <laughs> Speaking of going to school, like a lot of times after we do, we cover something, I mean, the first few days, first few, first week or two, <laughs> sometimes it's a lot of opinions, a lot of different like ideas and follow up that we eventually incorporate back into the show too. Um, so yes, it is actually kind of part of keeping the show healthy and keeping us honest and keeping the focus on getting things right. Yeah, and certainly telling us when we got it wrong because that happens from time yeah. to time. <laughs> yeah. no. Which is which we value. No, never, never, never. Um, if you're new, you may not be familiar with Jupiter.tube. That's a, a, a project in a box for us where we are learning a lot. It's a peer tube instance. That's a self-hosted YouTube kind of. And we do our live streams there. And then for a while, we keep an archive of the various live streams up there so you can catch them after the fact if you wanted to get something. We don't make it easily available like in an RSS feed like we do for our members, but it stays up there for a while. Um, and it has been um, not always perfect. In fact, just recently, I was... It's so funny, you guys. I swear to God, this is a true story. Before self-hosted last week, I was kind of getting everything set up. It's like a couple hours before we go live. And I was just thinking to myself, man, it's so nice that we run our own peer tube and... You know, I don't have to worry about any of the script monkeys at YouTube that are taking it down for maintenance right as I'm trying to go live. It's just always available. And if the only time it ever is down is when I'm working on it because I'm the one that runs it. And it's totally not, you know, going to be down right now because I'm about to do my own show. So I wouldn't take it down now, of course. I can't I, I can't be doing maintenance while I'm going live, right? Could I? Yeah. So, of course, I go live and the PeerTube instance doesn't start. <laughs> and, of course, this was a week when I had linked it everywhere. I was like, hey, I'm, we're going to be live this afternoon. I put it in Telegram. I put it in Twitter. I put it in Matrix. I put it on Discord. I put it everywhere. And I even like went out of my way to say, hey, you can use this link after the stream, too. It'll still be valid. The stream will stay up. You're going to love it. Just use this link. It's, it's, it's a good link. It's a valid link. And, of course, it doesn't work. And the stream doesn't start. And the first thing you do on PeerTube when you're troubleshooting is you generate a new post, which creates... <laughs> a new link so i contacted wes while i was live already doing self-hosted i'm like wes can you take a look at beer tube i don't want to make a new link um and you went looking and i don't know if you found anything i, I mean there obvious? were some suspicious errors in the log sort of like some unknown ids maybe something got sort of half started or hadn't ran into an error but i mean nothing was wrong on the server itself so uh when in doubt yeah i think maybe too was sort of the right you know toggling of because there's like there's a lot of delays in the system, and so like the right toggling of like a clean Docker Compose stack, as well as like a clean reset of the you know piping off the feed mm -hmm. to actually send it over to PeerTube to be restreamed. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was toggling out on my end while you were restarting the services, and one of the combinations or whatever fixed it. Locked. So I was like, oh yeah, that's the downside to hosting your own stuff is sometimes you have to fix it on the fly. The nice part is we can reboot it whenever we want. Yeah, and um, this is also this is hosted on Linode. And this is one of the ways we can put something that gets a lot of traffic because we're streaming video. And the way PeerTube works is it uses a web torrent to get the video rolling. And then um, as people join it, it begins to do a peer-to-peer -peer thing. So initially, we invest a lot of data. And then as people join the stream, they kind of build out a peer-to-peer -peer stream. But it's been a fascinating test of Linode. And it's been a fascinating test of just like how much we can throw at it. And then also, it's been interesting to use Nix in this server capacity up there and kind of learn the best practices for using Nix as a server, which I think have been really, really beneficial and really educational. I've, I, in fact, it's, it's one of my favorite servers to work on now because it's so clean. Just simple, yeah. Mm -hmm. it just very, works. It's been very nice. And uh, so the live stream we do here is on Sundays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern over at jupiter.tube. And that's kind of just uh, an extra, Benny. I mean, the main focus by... 99% of the audience is on the audio downloads. And so that remains our our focus. But it's up there mostly as a, as a way for us to uh, 
also build out like a, a set of available APIs. Our website ties into the PeerTube API, API to update aspects of the website in real time, and it'll be piped into um, our podcasting 2.0 support for the live stream in the future for the lit tag when we get there. So it sort of acts as infrastructure. So it's not really necessary that the videos take off over there, which is fine if you want to watch it over there, because it also offers basically um, services for that we need for the back end. Yeah, right. It's kind of nice. It's really neat. And we can, you know, host it ourselves. We have full control over it. Sure. Yeah, we got to provide for that. But I, I think our next step there is we, you know, we didn't quite uh, make the jump to 5.0. Mm. There is now a 5.0.1 mm. point release that we mm. should probably uh, give a shot. Mm -hmm. I think we will. Uh, the other thing that sets us apart a little bit is we do have a membership system. Uh, we wrapped up our Patreon at the end of last year. Kind of just in time, too. You guys probably saw this, uh, but a author over at The Information did a two-month deep dive into Patreon. And um, the heavy-hitting information is actually on their Twitter feed because the whole article is actually behind a paywall. But the bits you need to know about discrimination settlements, sketchy stock sales, failed projects, staffing issues, money issues... Uh, all of this is in a Twitter thread that is public with screenshots. And I'm concerned about Patreon because I think a lot of folks in the free software community have used it to fund development or use it to fund their production of their podcast. And I think Patreon is a significant problem that if I were, if I were using it for, you know, a percentage of my income right now, I would, well, I did migrate off and I, I just recommend uh, others do it too. Um, yeah, it's, maybe they'll be all right. You know, they might be fine. I'm not trying to like fear monger here. I just think if this is how you make your living and you pay your bills, you really better start thinking about this. It's tough, right? Because like we've seen, there's a certain, you know, it lowers the barrier to entry because if you already have a Patreon account, it's totally. really easy to be like, yeah, okay, I will set this up. I've already entered payment info. I don't have to go find my wallet. Yeah. Uh, but then the downside of that, as with so many centralized things, is if Patreon's not doing well, is, you know, has bad business practices, it's not well as an organization, whatever, or just starts having different aims than meets the use case for, say, an open source project, got to figure something else out. Yeah. And it's not trivial to take all of those subscriptions and sponsors and supporters with you to whatever new platform you land on. Yeah, I was scared as hell because um, we kind of have a, a hybrid value for value model here. We take advertising to pay like a, a big portion of our costs, but it's very specific advertising that is sort of each deal has been custom worked out by me as, as I felt they were a good fit for the show. And they take a while to set those deals up. They're slow. You can't do a bunch of those in a year. So what we've done is we've tried to diversify. That's the other thing. I've been doing this for 15 years, and I've learned that you got to diversify if you want to make your living online. And so ads is a portion, but we would prefer to always make much more of our income, as much as possible, from value that is contributed by the audience directly. Because I always want the audience to be the biggest customer. And so we've kind of set up a couple of systems for that. And uh, the tried and true system that is supporting ongoing production that invests every day in all of the shows is our members. And that is, that is like when we went independent again, that was one of the things I had to launch with because I knew that was a foundational thing for us. And you can support the show at unpluggedcore.com. It gets you access to an ad-free version of the show, or you can get in a nice uh, RSS feed with all the relevant metadata info, the live stream version, which is like two more shows, basically. <laughs> at least. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was something we wanted to do as a way to say thank you and contribute value back. We also uh, have taken on, starting last year, uh, Boost as a way to kind of tip a, a specific episode with a bit of value and a message to say, thank you for that production. I got value from your show. Here is something I'd like to say. And then we read those messages on the air. That is a really compelling system because there's no Patreon. There's no PayPal. There's no Stripe. There's no MasterCard. There's no Bank of America. There's no Zelle. There's no middleman there. It's an open network. It's kind of like... Patreon reminds me of using like AOL Instant Messenger or ICQ and using Lightning is more like using XMPP or SMTP. It's an open protocol with an open network. Uh, so you can use whatever app you want. You can store it however you want. Maybe it's fully self-hosted. Maybe it's hosted by somebody and there's no middleman. 
And it feels like if you're going to build a business on a technology, you want it to be the open source technology that's also an open network. And so that's what the boosts do there. And um, that's been incredible. Um, in, in December, I think it was, we ran a 30% split for the Graphene, Giraffe OS project. And uh, we paid them out, I think it was like almost 200 bucks. We almost, you know, they got, so we gave them a 30% split for the, after we launched the Giraffe OS challenge. We gave them a 30% split, and uh, that was just a way to kick back because we got value out of that project. Indeed. Um, and so now I've set up new splits with uh, new contributions going to Podverse, which is the GPL podcasting 2.0 app, and a Fountain FM. And the way the Fountain FM works is that actually will make the other boosts get calculated into the Fountain FM charts. So now when people boost from anywhere in the Lightning Network, it will help our ranking on the Fountain FM charts, which is fantastic. That's great. Using the open network there, not making that just proprietary to Fountain FM. That's just kind of a way that we can, one of the technologies with the Boostagrams is this split capability. So Wes, Brent, and myself get a split. The network gets a split, and then the open source projects that we put in there get a split. And that's all transparent. It does mean with some interfaces, you have to approve more times. Like when you do Albi at the podcast index, you have to approve it for every single split individually right like a client side figures out what the splits are how to apply them and then you send each of the payments yeah so it's but in other in other apps like podverse on the phone it just does it all automatically and it's nice because it's right there you get to see all the receipts you get to see all the accounting right there which is a total flip on the sponsorship model and it's a total flip on all the other models where people can turn off their numbers on patreon every sat to every person how much they each got how much the show got, it's all right there in transparency. We like that a lot. Um, we're working on bringing that to the member feeds this year, too. True Grits boosted in this week about that. And yes, we are working on that. But we've expanded beyond just boosts for ways that we have the mumble room, uh, people contribute, but also our GitHub has yeah. been a tremendous resource for our community over the last year. And our community built us a new website. If you go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, that's not made by us. That is made and maintained by our community. It's incredible. And so they've made the podcasting website that they want, which they thought of stuff we never would have thought of. And there's more projects there, Brent, more projects coming, more things to support some of the podcasting 2.0 initiatives. Yeah, I think we have a long list of things we want to try to get in there. And uh, I think transcriptions was one that feels recent yeah. that maybe we might get to. I know a whole bunch of RSS feed stuff is on your mind too, Chris. And uh, so I think... I don't know. It uh, just keeps on going over there. I don't think you want to miss anything. So go check it out. Yeah, it just depends on what you want to participate in. Um, the reason why we wanted to mention all of this is simply you can just listen and enjoy the show. And we're happy that you did. Or if you're looking for a, a W, you know, if you're looking for a win, something that scratches an itch where you can contribute and you, the results of your contribution show up on air, they show up on the website. You didn't have to go through a committee. You didn't have to sit in multiple meetings. You could just do a little bit of work and get a win. If that, and you want to be around people who like the same stuff you like, we wanted to bring this up. And a lot of this stuff, not everything, but just about darn near everything we've talked about today is listed with links at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash community. I love seeing folks who are just popping in asking, you know, hey, has anyone else done this or thought about doing it this way? And if you ever want people to help sort of rubber duck debug or just shoot ideas around toy with things i i've been surprised how many times you see stuff where it's like i've thought about that or i've tried that tool and here pops someone else who either needs some help with it or uh, has some great ideas i've never thought of yeah i want to give one last like underscore plug for our matrix chat room matrix is in a special place right now where it's still in the early adopter phase and it's probably going to be in a prolonged early adopter phase but what that means is the signal there is extremely high the conversations generally are very level-headed and very respectful as long as chris isn't taking part in them yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't i have a very i do have a very short fuse for adults that can't figure out how to communicate together online i i'm i'm a 40 year old 40 plus year old man i do not have time for people that have not figured out how to communicate but uh when people on general it's you know when you consider how many thousands of people we have in there it's been a non-issue and um, so many great conversations happen in there from so many different angles. It is tremendous because there's such crap online these days on social media, 
and all these, and to have this place that is like an island of the last bastion of good people. It is really something. Not that all of the places aren't great, but oh, I just want to say thank you to our Matrix community. You make it worth running that big server. Linode.com slash unplugged. That's where you go to get the $100 and to support the show. Linode is the Linux Geeks Cloud. So go to linode.com slash unplugged. They have 11 data centers online today. They're bringing on another dozen this year, and they've been at this for nearly 19 years, making the best platform to run Linux. And they've invented technologies that have been contributions to this stack over the years. They've become their own ISP, and they have pushed Linux forward in the data center since before AWS was a twinkle in Bezos's eye. And the performance is incredible. You guys know I wouldn't use it unless that was the case. And the reliability has been rock solid. We've been a customer for about three years or so, but I have friends that have been a customer for like a decade and they have absolutely nothing but good things to say. Linode's been rolling out screaming fast new NVMe based block storage as well. So their block storage is getting faster. Their host storage is fast. They have AMD Epic processors, if that's your thing, and an easy to use dashboard that brings it all together. After you've been using Linode for more than just a minute, if you're like me, you're going to start appreciating the API, not because you're like an API guy. I'm not, but because it just makes things quick and simple. And you could take advantage of things like their command line client on the Linode that you're on. So before you do something drastic, you could just issue a command with that CLI app to do a snapshot. Or like, this is how I get files up on the S3 object storage that I want to link out. Really easy to do that. Plus they have really good customer service. So if you want to know how to use some of these services and tooling, like, like their S3 compatible object storage, like their cloud firewalls, like their powerful DNS manager, if you ever have any questions, the support's there to help you. I mean, 365, you call them up on Christmas, tier one's going to help you right then and there. They're not going to forge you on. It's because they had to build a business that could compete in ways that some of these other cloud duopolies are just simply not architected to compete. They just can't offer some of these services that Linode can. Linode has a tactical advantage, you could say. The best customer support, super fast rigs, not just me saying that, but benchmarked by industry cloud benchmarkers that do this kind of thing, and a Linux culture that runs deep. I think there's a lot of reasons, but you'll find your own when you go to linode.com slash unplugged, take advantage of that 100 bucks, support the show, and build something. Like a NextCloud. I said it. I think you should try NextCloud on Linode. I think it's particularly awesome. They have just recently rolled out some brand new one-click deployments. Well, one-click-ish. Sometimes there's some vital questions I have to ask you, so you have to fill out a few questions. It's like a couple of clicks, put in a username and password, that kind of stuff. Uh, and the one I wanted to call out today, because they're always adding new ones, is two, actually. Apache Airflow, which is kind of like a roll your own, do this, then that solution, Python-based, and only Office Docs. You probably already know what this is, but you can create and collaborate on text documents, spreadsheets, presentations. It'll open up DocX and XLSX files. It's compatible with Microsoft Office and OpenOffice. But yeah, it's up in the cloud. It's collaborative. You can host it yourself. It's a great way to use that hundred bucks. So go try something. There's lots of great options and tons of popular apps. They do have one-click deployments for NextCloud, Minecraft, Mastodon, and many, many more. Try them all out. You're going to love them. You got a hundred bucks to play with. Linode.com slash unplugged. Well, the people are demanding it. It's time for a Giraffine OS update. I mean... It's been a while now. You've had time to get out of the honeymoon phase, I think. Live life day to day. Remember what it used to be like on that other platform we're not going to name. How you doing, Chris? Well, um, you know, I remember, I remember the first couple of weeks were really great. That was fun. You um, kind of discovery like, oh, it is possible for this to be, you know, not trash. Yeah. Yeah, because I kind of went in with low expectations. Because I thought, you know, how could graphene, I mean, graphene OS, how could it compete with iPhone, right? Like this, you know, I just kind of bind into the iPhone hype and I'd switched away from the uh, Android around Pixel 3 era. Kind of, I, I kind of was fading at the end of the Nexus line. Right. And then kind of faded completely after the Pixel 3. And I just, around the iPhone 7, I just switched over and just got on their membership program and got a phone every year and just forgot about it. But, you know, I could see... Apple's incentives changing over the years, especially if they have a reduction on iPhone sales, which, by the way, seems like it is exactly what I said is happening, is they're seeing a massive drop-off in sales because 
turns out when things get expensive and, you know, it costs more just to get from work to home, people don't want to buy thousand dollar phones every year. Right. And, um, one of the first things you can cut back on is a fancy phone because your, your current phone's working good enough. And so Apple needs to continue to drive that revenue and they're going to have to get that revenue somewhere else. And they're going to turn inward on their billion users. So my thought was, let's start to distance ourselves from that. It's not an immediate problem, but it's going to be a problem someday in the future. Let's distance ourselves. Let's get that work done now. But at the same time, very concerned about Google. You know, I've mentioned it before, but we saw that story from the New York Times about the dad who had a couple of photos on his phone because he's doing telemedicine for his kid. Google suspended his 15-year-long account, sent all of the details, every email, every chat, every text message, because he used Google Voice and Google Fi, every photo. They did a complete export of his entire account, gigs and gigs and gigs, and automatically sent it all over the police for them to go through it, to find anything they want. And then they disabled his account, which disabled his phone line, and they refused to re-enable it because of policies. And so I was looking at this reality of Apple becoming more hostile and Google clearly already being too hostile. And I thought, okay, it's time to take action, start building something that I thought I could adopt that eventually I could have my family members adopt. And that was, you know, pretty much the end of the goal. But I realized I needed to put a date on it because there was going to be some point where I'd want to bail, where I'd want to be like, screw it. I just got to go back to the iPhone for tonight. And then once you do that, it just sort of, it's a right. snowball. Because you, I mean, then it's still built into your habits. You still need it to do some certain task. And that means you can't really get rid of it. And that moment, that moment came about a week and a half, two weeks ago. My daughter had her first concert. She was very excited about it. And we had like 15 friends and family show up for this thing. It was this massive thing. And she was, it was like, she was the star of the night. She was beaming. And I wanted to capture as much of it as I could. And I was just struggling with the Google phone camera app thing just yeah. just so laggy and slow sometimes i mean other times great and the zoom was better than what i could get on the iphone but it also just missed so many shots and that's when i had the realization like this has always been a problem for me with android devices and i think apple is just a little closer to the hardware yeah the effects are applied real time so you see them in the preview you get you, what you see in the preview is what you get in the shot and i think they they take the picture like a few milliseconds before you've actually tapped the glass, like they're capturing it all the time because on the pixel, it's clearly taking the picture when I press the button, but the iPhone's taking the picture I meant to take the pixels taking the picture. I actually took with your slow human reaction. Yes. times, Yeah. So that was challenging. Um, however, you know, I, I, I had to think about it and I had to really go down to basic principles of why I'm doing this. And I had to ask myself if I'm doing this to avoid lock into corporations that get me hooked on their sauce that then make me targets for their automated systems to abuse. Maybe it's worth just getting a camera, you know, like I really like having it on my phone. I like having it integrated with image and I'll get to that. And I like having all of that workflow, but what am I trying to achieve here? And is this problem greater than my goal? And I came to the conclusion that it wasn't that I, if I, if this is something I'm going to do, then I can just bring a damn camera. And it'd probably get a better picture anyways. And then I really will get the shot I wanted. That's true. So that was, but I had a couple of moments where I had to really kind of get down to the basic principles of why am I doing this? What are my motivations? Is this worth proceeding? Another one was, you know, the, the Apple ecosystem's a monster. We all know this. My particular habits were the HomePods and the Apple TV. <laughs> They're like peanut butter and jelly, man. And it works so great. Like whatever you're watching on the Apple TV when you got an iPhone and you got the watch, Whatever you're watching on your TV, automatically the controls show up on your watch and you can pause the TV. You don't do nothing. You just hit play. The whole system, like through DNS broadcast, figures out what's going on and the controls just show up on your watch. I lost all that. I couldn't do, couldn't send audio to the HomePods, couldn't control the Apple TV. Ecosystem punishment, right? I, you know what? This is the tax. You got, you know, eventually you end up paying the tax. And um, one of the things I was able to do to work around this was I slid on a little home assistant. You know, I brought in a middleman. And the home assistant bridges the gap. And so I have widgets now on my phone that control the playback of my different televisions in the house here. So you can see here, Wes, uh, it looks like on the main Apple TV right now, they're playing uh, music. Oh, yeah. At home. Delightful. <laughs> yeah. And then the you can see the bedroom TV isn't playing anything right now. So you can just pause their music right now. Yeah. Or it could. 
Mm -hmm. Or I can skip to the next track. Yeah. So I well, have. Well, you hate this too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told them not to listen to that. Uh, but I just have widgets on my home screen that control the two different. That looks great. Television boxes. Yeah. It's fantastic. And I can send stuff to them and I can put the home pods on here if I want. So utilizing Home Assistant kind of bridged that gap and made up for the ecosystem tax. So I didn't have to replace the Apple TV. I don't have to replace the home pods. And obviously, uh, for anyone who's somehow never listened to self hosted, you, uh, you're just like a little bit bought into the whole. Home Assistant platform already. So sort of, it wasn't anything you had yeah, to set up now. Sort of runs the entire place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, HAL 9000 is alive and well in Lady Jupes. And then, of course, you got to replace some of the cloud services, guys. You know, uh, we talked about photos. That was my big one. Got to replace photos. Image is really pulling its weight here. Photo Prism was great. But Image, if you're on Android, is so unbeatable. It's everything I liked about Google Photos, where it has a really clean app. It's, you can use it as your main gallery app to just view your photos. Nice. And it automatically upgrades your photos in the background or uploads your photos in the background when you connect to Wi-Fi. Perfect. You don't do nothing. It just does it. And then they've got a super fast, clean web UI. They have focused on speed the entire time and they're adding features on like they just added sharing. Um, oh, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. I, see, I've been curious because I know we, we talked about it a little bit, but it was so new. I was kind of yeah. letting you try it out, wait and see to see like, it's, it's going to be sharing is something they're like, I kind of need if I'm going to really invest in the platform. Yeah. It's definitely still new. Um, they even warned that on their GitHub. But yeah, the files are just sitting on the file system, right? It's not like they're in some sort of weird proprietary format or anything. Even better. So it's just sitting on top of that. And why did you feel like you had to move away from Photo Prism? Because when we touched on it a few months ago, you were like totally jazzed about it. But it sounds like that tune's changed a little bit for you. I might go back. I wanted one thing, right? So I wanted, I wanted one app. I didn't want to have to like put together a bunch of stuff. And when I'm on the, when I was on the iPhone, I had no choice but to use photo sync. And then I might as well use photo prism on top of that to get some of the, uh, AI features. Right. Cause you didn't have it. It didn't come with your first tool. So you, you needed to add something anyway. But with image, if you're on Android, the integration is so tight. It's like Google photos where it just is a really small, clean, lean app for viewing photos locally. It uploads to the background super fast on both ends and then they're layering on the the face recognition and stuff like that and i'm fine with that approach build it up and get it there yeah if you get me my photos in a place and i can look at them on the web yeah right, right. uh this is i m m i c h and it's you know it's a simple docker compose setup on the server side and it's a simple app to install from your favorite app store and you're good to go I, i'll probably go back to photo prism at some point too and just have it look at the same directory compare and contrast there's a few things that I haven't figured out. Probably the most embarrassing from switching from the iPhone is uh, music. I really don't know what to do about music. Like, I, I want to go with my own collection again. But yeah, I was going to say, what's the goal here? Are you trying to totally get off all the, all the streaming services? Or just have another option to have, you know, easily display and play back what you do happen to have on, in your own? It just feels like all the playlists suck so bad on all these streaming <laughs> services, and I only want like a few hundred songs. So why restream the few, same few hundred songs when I could just download them, set them up on a player, cache them locally, and just listen to them? It's all Dean Martin, isn't it? Yeah, it's all Dean Martin. Chris, yeah. has Jellyfin played a part here for you in a possible solution? Because I know we've had the Jellyfin challenge this month, and I wondered about I that. I started going down that path, um, but my problem is like I don't... I don't like anything I'm using to like collect the music, organize the music, and then you know, Jellyfin would just be one of the front ends, but it's the back end that I don't like. And the most and then here's the embarrassing thing. This is where it gets embarrassing. Is that the whole family is on like the Apple plan. Right. Which I pay for. <laughs> I'm the jerk that pays for the like five other people. So here you are paying for these services that yeah. you're like, no, no, I'm not gonna touch them. Well, so I what I what I inevitably just ended up doing, and this is just a temporary fix, but I I did it. Um, Temporary. Yeah. I put fits. the I, I put the Apple Music app on Android, and then I, I didn't know they had that. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. They do. They do, dude. How they do. It? It's it's about as good as it is on the iPhone, which is to Can say you mediocre. Write an Android app in Swift. Uh, yeah. And then what I do is I just downloaded all the songs because you can download them locally. So I just went and downloaded a few playlists, <laughs> save them on the phone, and since I've been on Android, I've just been listening to however many songs this is. It doesn't tell me. I've just been listening to these on loop. It's getting bad. It's getting embarrassingly bad. And I just did like a three, three hour, no, six hour road trip on Saturday. And it was all the same music. Now, are you limited by how much you can store locally? 
I mean, obviously disc and stuff, but by the app. No, not by the app. No, okay. just by disc. I mean, that seems like a pretty reasonable yeah. middle ground. Oh, and they're if you have to if you have to, given your circumstances, pay for that service already. And they're lossless, right? They oh. have like all these crazy codecs and stuff, and I'm already paying for it. But I don't know. It feels so cheesy to like move away from Apple and move away from the iPhone, get on Giraffe and OS, and then end up using Apple Music. You can still work, you know. I mean, like start collecting more things in the background. Yeah. That's the nice thing about a streaming service is, you know, once every now and then you find a new band or a new song and then, you know, so, yeah. But it, this strategy does go against one of your like pillars for the year, which is self-sovereign approaches. So this, you know, doesn't really solve that. So it feels like there's room for improvement here. And it sounds like also you're looking for suggestions. I am. I'm kind of curious, you know, a real solid workflow to like collect music and serve it up, I suppose. It's always an, it's an ongoing quest. We talk about it on self-hosted quite a bit too. It's just fine. It's just sort of silly. I ended up on Apple music. Yeah. But I, it's like, and I might stick with it for a while because I'm going to pay for it. Yeah. Even if I don't use it, they're all using it. I mean, if it works, they, you know, they integrate it with the system. Uh, you can hit play and pause, does Bluetooth. You can cache it locally. Funny what Apple selectively creates apps for Android for. Notice right. there wasn't an iMessage app in there. <laughs> Now, does Apple Music have Chromecast support? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it does, actually. And I don't think it has AirPlay support either. So, you know, let's see. No, it does not. It does not offer any kind of, no kind of remote casting of any kind. Shucks. Yeah. Go figure, right? Now, have you heard the good word about VLC? <laughs> yeah. Actually, really happy with the VLC app. I've set up my, uh, all my Wise cams come into uh a Docker wise bridge that creates RTMP streams. And I fed all those RTMP streams into VLC, but because everything's over tail scale, it's their tail scale IP. So anywhere I'm at, I can pull up any of the cameras in jupes using just good old VLC. I don't have to have any weird apps and I can just immediately over tail scale anywhere in the world, pull up a camera feed. See there, boom, there's the driveway. Hey, look at that. Look at that. I'm pulling up the driveway right now and I can see that the whole family must be out somewhere because nobody's in the driveway. And that's just using VLC. It's fantastic. You know, the other, you know, while I'm talking about family, I think this is an area where I'm a little kind of lukewarm because I know this is going to bug, bug some people in the audience. There's not a large device selection here, guys. If you want to use Drafting OS, uh, you're, you're looking at the Pixel hardware. Now, you can pick up used Pixels for a good price. But, you know, if you've maybe had an old Moto around or an LG phone or a OnePlus, you're not putting Graphene OS on it. And that's kind of unfortunate because for kid devices, they can they can go through those things. And it's really nice to be able to just find a good budget Android device and then to be able to put a good reliable OS on there. And Graphene OS relies on hardware components that are in the Pixel devices for its security. And so it's just not going to happen. So I think that could be viewed as a negative of Draft yeah. is that it's not available for other devices, but the reason is for good reasons. So not a full negative. It, it does make it a little less flexible for how you're going to deploy it, which is something we sort of come to expect in a lot of our uh, open source solutions, right? But yeah, if there's good reasons for it, it makes sense. And Chris, how are you feeling about hardware quality? I know you've been using Pixels before, but this is quite a jump from version to version. So I'm curious how that feels in your hand. And Yeah, it's, it's big. It's I got the big one, right? I got the big XL Pro one or whatever. Uh, it's big, but I like it a lot. The screen's really good. Fingerprint reader in the, under the glass is nice. Performance has been pretty decent except for the camera app. Battery life has been better than I expected since I'm not running a bunch of the play services for push. Yeah, I'm happy. Are you, are you happy you got one during this challenge? Are you happy with the build quality, Wes? Yeah, it's been a nice upgrade from the Pixel 3, that's for sure. I've been yeah. having a lot of fun playing with the camera. I mean, it's not perfect. There, you know, I've noticed some of the same flaws. Sometimes the app is a little... You're, you're like, yeah, you must be doing a lot of processing because you're kind of chugging right now. But for like slower, more composed shots, it's been it's been really nice. And there's a lot of there's a lot of shiny little features. I'm still um figuring out what pieces of the Google and other ecosystems I do or don't want in the short or long term. Um and I definitely gotten pretty used to say like being able to yell at my Pixel 3 to just have it, you know, like ubiquitously and have it do simple things like I don't know, pull up an app in the car or you know, switch things around. Uh, I've not enabled anything like that at the moment, but uh, kind of considering it. I was also debating like 
Mm, and curious what you're using. Like, well, what are you sticking with the stock drafting keyboard? Have you switched in any fancy mm. keyboard sort of setup? Because I realized too, I'd grown kind of used to like the Google keyboard on my old phone. Yeah, yeah. Swift key just re-updated. I, I'm playing around with. I, I put the Google board on there. I put the Swift key on there. I've been trying the stock one. Um, seeing seeing what sticks. I think the Google board's probably the best one, but I'm sure they're probably collecting all kinds of information on that one. But it does feel like it's the most developed one. You touched on something I wanted to follow up on, though, and that is Android Auto. Man, it sucks. <laughs> it just really is a bummer. And it's not going to come. It's not going to happen for Giraffe you know, It's just, you know, when you get a car with a screen because you want to use it, and then you end up switching your device out so you can't use the screen. That's for that. a shame. Yeah. And then, you know, Volkswagen doesn't really properly take advantage of the screen real estate. They just have this crappy display of like the track information when you're doing Bluetooth. It just sucks. It is what it is. I'm living without it. I'm not loving it, but at least it works. Yeah, Matt, see, this is one area where I'm just, I just have a Bluetooth connection, so that's yeah. what I, that was my, all I needed to replace. Yeah. I've got this weird cable that connects into the bottom of my phone. Uh, that seems to work pretty reliably. You might try that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're so like, funny. Just, it only does audio, though. <laughs> you're so funny. I gotta have keyboard, I gotta have uh, audio controls on the steering wheel. I mean, I'm not, what am I, taking my hands off the wheel to skip or t change tracks? Yeah, it's dangerous. Don't do what I do. It has been nice to sort of like replace things. Like I started using shadow weather instead of, you know, just the Google weather. Because I didn't need a ton from it. And it's not yep. like I don't look at other weather sources anyway. But Shadow weather is great. Yeah, I was really appreciating like the neat little graphics that they've got. It was really clear to go see like hour by hour. And yeah, and they'll do a thing where they'll like, they'll kind of like aggregate multiple weather sources and kind of give you like their modeling based on multiple inputs which is really kind of a cool feature uh i love shadow weather too for alerts mm. some really you can put in different locations so i put in some spots where we've you know camped in the in the winter and gotten screwed so now i get weather alerts proactively so i'm just aware of the weather that's going on out there shadow weather is a, is a great one so many great apps but the unbelievable effing win for me in this entire thing didn't see it coming at all is freaking next cloud Holy crap. What a winner. Um, surprising win of this 65 day challenge. And I, I, I just got to talk about it here for a second. And I want to start with a question that came in on the matrix. Dudist of men wrote in, um, and he wrote, we've heard about, uh, how you guys use S3 backend storage for next cloud in the cloud, but what about your local instance in lady jupes? What are the specific pros and cons of how you have it set up? He's tried the Docker container and he was curious. Yeah, so we do run a Nextcloud instance on Linode using object storage. That's been working great. Yeah. But for this one, I just went and got the upstream Docker image, got their compose file, tweaked it a little bit. I am using a SQLite database, which is a big no-no, but it's been really simple. And then I have all the files on the local file system. So then I can just browse them normally using a terminal, or I can back them up with standard tools. I'm not using object storage in Jupes. But it's been... I surprise how nice it's been because i knew nextcloud was useful for doing the pods but i had of no, course we've been using it for a while there no idea how great it was no idea how great it was for personal use absolutely love it yeah you're making me think it's a uh, high past time that i get my own nextcloud going well you've put in a lot of work to sort of build up a new ecosystem you found new apps you've spent some money in the play store maybe who knows i you did all of those seem like they might create a little bit of an incentive to stick around. But I know you. And sometimes you have particular needs. You have workflows that you've adapted to that you have for very legitimate reasons. Um, and, <laughs> you know, you have, you're not afraid to have multiple ecosystems in your life. I'm just thinking, mm. like, sometimes you get work done on a Mac. Mm. I remember a couple of years ago, you had that iPad Pro that was meet, mm -hmm. really meeting some needs for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I could see a world where maybe the iPhone sticks around. It's a, a device to take to kid events. It's just something you have. You don't need it with you, but sometimes it, you know, goes in the bag. Yeah, I thought maybe it just kind of become like a toy after this was all done. When I started the challenge, I expected I'd just have an Android device I could test new installs on for coverage on the shows and yep. that kind of thing. But no, I think it is going to stick because the ultimate goal overall is more achievable than I thought it was. If you're willing to stand some of these things up, or perhaps you substitute instead of running your own next cloud, maybe you go get a Proton Mail account or or a fast mail account. Some you service you're that. more comfortable with that isn't uh, say yeah. Big G. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you could kind of you could kind of take different passes at this, and you don't have to go as you know off grid with it as I did necessarily. Okay, so the like, I think it will stick. Yeah, I think it's going to stick. 
moment of truth then. Like, yeah. What happens with the old iPhone? Like, are, are yeah. you going to give it to, is it going to be no longer readily available for you? Or is it just going to be sort of, you know, sitting well, on the desk in the studio? That is, that's a real challenge because part of what's going to let this drafting OS stick is I still have the Apple watch for the iMessages that the family sends me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That is the sticky spot. The ecosystem bites again. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> ecosystem lock in. Locked in the got me, Wes. So that's a problem. It is a problem. You know, um, it might be good for the kids to experience pure SMS like you did. <laughs> they all were worried. They were all worried I was going to make them switch when I started this. They all were like, Dad, you're not going to make a switch, are you? Even even the wife said that, actually. <laughs> the whole dang family. They <laughs> First he came in with this Linux thing, and, and now... Admittedly, I went into this thinking, can I make this work for them? So <laughs> they were right. Um you know, I, so I don't know what I'll do there. It's such a pain in my butt. They're all hooked on it. Not just them two, but the extended family too. They're all hooked on the blue messages. So what I need is a solution that is viable that uh, can forward those to like Telegram or Matrix or something like that. But thankfully, there isn't a Wear Watch worth owning at the moment, in my opinion. So I have time here and uh, I'll just continue to use this Apple Watch for a bit. And, you know, until I have another solution for iMessage. I know there's a few out there, but none of them look very good. Such a such a frustrating thing, you know, that they make the music app and they don't make it so frustrating. So, uh. so close. I'm curious about you, Wes. You've started this challenge along with Chris. And uh, do you think you'll stick with Draphine on your new device? Or you think you might dabble back in the uh, vanilla area? No, that's an interesting question. I've thought about it a little bit. But I'm really enjoying how much more in control and aware of the pieces that go on in my phone. And like, I've, you know, I'd, in the past I had like rooted phones and I'd played around with it a little bit more and tried other ROMs and stuff. But there was like a, there was a time in the middle where it felt like it wasn't quite, it wasn't advancing at the same rate as what was going on in the, in the world of Android. And it just was it hadn't hit that same level as polish that I felt like was worth the limited amount of stuff that I need to do on my phone. You know, like I want a little flexibility. I like to be able to install, say like whatever, a uh, new VPN app is out there or terminal app or whatever, but I didn't need to be customizing it all the time. And drafting is kind of a sweet spot where it, when I'm daily using it, I'm not often reminded. Maybe if I'm just on some new weird app or something, but by and large, it just feels like a phone. I forget about that. I've customized this, that I've installed some weird third party operating system on there. But at the same time, like having the play store have to just respect the phone and not, install stuff in the background whenever it wants <laughs> mm-hmm. how do you how do you migrate away from that yeah yeah it has the, the, the google stuff having to ask for your permission to do stuff is hard to get away from i don't need ar services no it sure wants to install ar services <laughs> but i don't need it trust me i don't need it and i feel like in a way this is opting out of that whole rat race that whole upgrade cycle um but also it it changes that balance of power I think maybe that's the biggest reason I'm sticking with it is I feel like my relationship with Google is a lot more under my control and my dependence on Apple is a lot less like where I have dependence now. That's mostly external dependencies. I can live with that for a while. Like I feel a lot better than I did. Like there was a lot of mountains that were climbed to get to this point, but the walk away, like the biggest like feature I could put on the list is I feel more in control of my data now. That's hard to really quantify, but it, it feels pretty damn good. Bitwarden.com slash Linux. Go over there right now. Go to bitwarden.com slash Linux and try it out for free as an individual user or get a trial for a team. Could be great for your business. Bitwarden is the easiest way for businesses and individuals to store, share, and sync your sensitive data. Passwords, two-factor codes, passphrases, other kinds of information that you want super encrypted end-to-end and protected something that maybe you want to move between your mobile device and your desktop so that way you can do advanced, secure logins to every website, app, and service you use. This is the low-hanging fruit right here. We talk about how hard privacy is online. People always go on and on about all the different issues and things that you should be worried about. But the reality is you solve most of those problems if you use a unique username and a unique password at every website or app or service you use. And now... Bitwarden's made it even easier to have a unique email address, unique username, unique password, unique email address. So if that one site, that one service, that one app gets compromised, you don't get your crap all over the internet. 
Because if you're using the same username and the same password for multiple sites and services, if one of them gets breached, they might as well all have gotten breached. And if you're using a password manager, maybe isn't up to snuff. Maybe their security isn't quite what it should be. I used to use LastPass a few years ago. I migrated to Bitwarden. Bitwarden makes it easy. You can check out bitwarden.com slash migrate. And something I appreciate, kind of that long-term confidence that I think both Wes and I get, is the fact that Bitwarden is open source. It's trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and businesses out there, including tons of people in our own audience. I have a real sense of security there because open source means long-term. They can't rug pull us, but also it means that things can get improved and fixed and added, and we all get to see it. It's available for all eyes. That's important. And of course, they get it audited as well. It's such a great tool. It's such a great service. It's really the best of two things coming together. A real sensible service built around a great core open source product. And Bitwarden has just been making the end user experience better and better. I love the account switching now in the mobile app. It's kind of newish. They're always rolling out new stuff, but this is one of my favorites from the last few months. I can now move between my JB account and my personal account. You could do this too for work, your personal, maybe the open source project you work for. And, you know, there's all kinds of new things landing. So check out Bitwarden's website, see all of them, because I just tell you about the ones I think are great. Maybe you know somebody that could use Bitwarden too. Send them to bitwarden.com slash Linux. You can do it. They can do it. It's just the low-hanging fruit to take care of their security and their privacy online. Let's all go right now to bitwarden.com slash Linux. Let's do it to support the show. Bitwarden.com slash Linux. If you want to send us some email feedback, linuxunplugged.com slash contact for that. And uh, I read them all. And I send all the really juicy ones to these two fellas. Max sent one in saying, well, actually apologizing for a late bat signal response, but just saying, hey, I'm going to be at scale and I would love to meet the JB crew if you happen to end up there. Well, all right, Max. Good to know. Noted. Thanks for writing in. Midge also sent in a little tip. Chris, I think this is for you around your Rust desk issues with the studio setup, the new studio setup that we have. Midge suggests... Uh, have you considered using Steam Remote Play as an alternative to your Rust Desk and Wayland issues? Sure have not. Huh? All you need to Ooh. do is link a host and client once, and it works like a charm on all kinds of platforms. Mitch uses it to access their workstations at home, uh, in the home office when they're on the road. Because I built, because it's built for game streaming, it's incredibly robust, and I've even used it on an LTE connection while traveling on high-speed trains around Europe. And as a bonus, you can even use the Steam Deck to log into your machines. I do like the idea of you using the Steam Deck to control the OBS machine. That just seems fun. Mm. <laughs> it's funny. Like, I, I got to play around with that because I hear all kinds of unique and kind of fun sounding uses for Steam Remote Play. So, so he's just basically pointing at the full desktop. And then you set it up on the remote end and then you just got like a little link. You click that pulls it right up yeah you've never played linux desktop it's a pretty <laughs> great game that's my favorite game it's a little crashy but you know a lot of good games it's are. way more fun than the video games i have on there i think it might be worth us trying this and maybe reporting back how it went and if it was a staple in the studio wouldn't that be kind of fun hmm yeah i like the idea that it performs well over lte now, in Linux Unplugged 494, that was the last episode, we talked about Restic and Borg and a bunch of other backup solutions, and we got quite a few pieces of mail in talking about that. But Martin had some feedback on Borg. After the last episode, I tried Borg with Vorta. I set up a backup to a NAS and to a cloud provider, PC Cloud, in just about minutes. It's super simple. I'm confident that my goldfish brain will remember the setup when I have to fiddle with it again in a few months. So thanks for the awesome tip. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right, right there, right? The goldfish brain. That's what you're, you're trying to like design towards so you can know that if you come back, you do need to do some kind of recovery. It's going to be in a hairy situation, so you need to be able to understand it pretty quick and not be able to easily do something dumb. Yep, that's well put. Advait wrote in as well with a little bit of a Restic warning. Chris, you asked about some feedback for Restic, and I had heard, you know, our our good buddy Alex had used it quite a lot. I think he's still using it, but I, I've never tried it myself, but Advait sends this warning. I was using Restic daily to back up my data files to an externally connected USB-C hard drive. It's been a while since that, but here's what I remember. One day I ran into integrity checks on my Restic backup file and found a bunch of fatal pack ID mismatch errors. So for a few months, 
and I didn't even know it, my daily backup file was actually corrupted and unrecoverable. I did some research and it seemed that Restic had no way to reliably prevent pack ID mismatch errors, nor does Restic actively report these errors when they do happen. So the user is not even aware of the errors as they're happening, unless there's some kind of manual check that you run. For me, this was a fundamental and very serious flaw in Restic. I immediately stopped using it and moved to something else, free file sync for those who are interested. If the JB audience knows a simple way to mitigate this Restic flaw, please do share. And P.S. I'm happy to support your great podcast as a Jupiter.party member. The main reasons I support your podcast is because you include chapters. Aww. You know, I like, I I've like never heard that, of that as the reason to support the show. I know people love the chapters, but that's great. I like the idea that, you know, content, so-so, but yeah. pff, your chapters. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. We yes. will take it. That's true. <laughs> All right. That is that is a good war story. I've You know, one of the things that does happen, so I do appreciate them taking the time to write in, is we hear a lot of like how amazing something is. We will hear some war stories, but it is good to get those in to kind of help balance the coverage. Figure yeah, it all absolutely. out. Well, and it just helps you make that decision because sometimes, you know, people have experiences where you're like, well, that used... Sometimes people have experiences where you're, you know, you can tell, yes, that was my intended use case. I better not choose that tool. Or the reverse where, you know, you've heard the good things, you've heard some of the bad paths, but maybe, you know, you're not planning to store that much data or use it that way. And it could still be a good tool, but you've got a more realistic picture. You know, I ran into almost an identical story this week uh, on my brother's computer. You know, I suggested he switched to Linux years and years and years ago. He's been loving it. and uh, But he had this problem with an old solid state drive that he had years ago that just failed on him. So he was like super cautious now. And so we set him up the last time we did it with like an automatic internal backup. So he has two hard drives in his laptop. One of them is just strictly used for mirroring his his SSD. Um, this is a Brent's backup services here. You're saying we set him up with? Well, I like to lump him in there because I feel like I don't want to take all of the uh, credit for things going wrong. But just this week, um, <laughs> he was poking at those backups because we've been talking about up upgrading him. And he was like, oh, I should make sure those backups are working and stuff. And what he noticed was that they weren't working at all. And he didn't he couldn't explain it. It took us a while to figure it out. So what we were using, and this is maybe my warning, is uh, we were using our snapshot, which has been fabulous for me. I've loved it. it. We just set it up as a cron job and it's just running in the background. It was great for a long time. But what ended up happening and that we discovered this week, thankfully before a failure, was that I was just silently failing and creating the backups anyway. So even the folders, you know, all had the dates that they were supposed to run on and stuff. So it seemed like it was working, but it wasn't. So I think the warning here from the last piece of feedback in my little story this week is go have a look at your backups every once in a while. Make sure they're working as you expect, because sometimes, no matter what you're using, sometimes it's just a little something misconfigured, or maybe in my brother's case, his hard drive was starting to fail, which is why it was getting IO errors and failing out. So good to, good to kind of keep an eye on that. And also a good reminder for me to get a little bit more modern about my backup strategies. I mean, it's tough, you know, validating your backups can be a non-trivial thing, depending on the nature of the files and how you're taking those backups. And it's just a task you got to, like, remember to do. And it can be tricky to, you know, in limited time you might have for projects, like, to try to get that monitoring right and, like, really know that when something breaks in all of the different ways that it might be able to break, <laughs> you'll actually get notified. That's Boy, why the yeah. whole, like, simple setup thing is can be really nice. Yeah, that's it. That's why, I, that's why I often talk about it, why I try to keep it simple. I'm a little concerned. After that story, though, because I was checking out on the old uh, presenter machine here, and I think I'm seeing errors from SDA. Uh oh, <laughs> oh no! Yeah, they're still showing up even right now. I checked this earlier. Shoot, I'm a little concerned about this. What kind of errors are these, Chris? Just general, like uh, here it is: uh, IO error, Dev SDA, and then it gives me the sector, and it gives me a flag. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Yeah. I've been suspicious of that sector for a while. Yeah. Now. Yeah, and that sector, 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 because it, it's... There's a lot of red in that log file. There's a lot of <laughs> sectors, yeah. <laughs> little concerned about that. And then also we have this uh, ATA1 device reported invalid CHS sector. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. We had a lot of errors. Oh, my gosh. Read FD, FPDMA queued. Oh, God, this machine's so screwed, you guys. <laughs> oh, this machine is... No. 
<laughs> we just got the OBS machine replaced. It's unbelievable. And I don't, I, ain't nobody got time to just sit here and replace computers well, all the time. Well, the RAM's still good. So we'll just sort of K exec well, to a Nix OS RAM box. <laughs> I mean, it's an old machine with an old CPU and that. But I was thinking, you know, we could just slap a different hard drive in there, put the Arc GPU in there. Might be fine. Might, might, might just might last a while. Um, all right, we almost got like a pick too, but it's not quite a pick, but it's a backup tool that really hasn't been brought up on the show to this point. And uh, we got an email into the show about it. I also got pinged on Matrix about it. So let's let's get it out there, Brent. Well, Mr. Camago wrote in, and uh, I smiled seeing this because Mr. Camago wrote in, I don't know, six months ago or so with another great uh, little tip. So I just smiled even before I read it, but this was a great one. Uh, they, they say, I use Duplicasi with Dropbox as a, as a Dropbox as a backup strategy. And I had never heard of Duplicasi, which is Duplicacy. There's a lot of the, uh, you know, it's Duplicati and Duplicity. You got to kind of keep those separate in your mind. But Chris, have you ever heard of this one and used it? Just from the audience, just from the audience, it, it hasn't made it on our list uh, at the first pass because uh, it's not open source. Um, but if you're okay with spending some money, and honestly, if it's a really good backup tool, it's like what, 50 bucks. It's not a lot of money. It's kind of worth it. Well, and what I noticed is it's actually free for personal use. So, Oh, really? Oh, really? That's something. I think it's 50 for a commercial license. So, you know, if you want to try some, it does have some neat technologies in the back end, but I thought maybe either of you could, could touch on that more so than I can. Well, I thought the thing that was interesting about it is that it actually has the web UI on the front end. Because, I mean, that's been one of the things about all these tools that we've talked about is there's no real nice web front end. And, you know, when you're working at this in anger, you want to be able to get to that information fast. And that information is, this is the, are, the, are the backups successful? Where are the errors? And how do I restore my data? And can I restore it to an arbitrary location? Now, what they do is they make their source code available on GitHub. And you get source code access. <laughs> Like, so you can read the source code, you can see the source code, you can see what it's doing. In theory, you could hire an auditor to audit the source code. Okay, so kind of like, you know, there's other projects in this, like Tarsnap, say. Yeah. You know, they're running the service in that case even, so it's even more so. But uh, I guess mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a better step than a totally proprietary situation. Yeah, I imagine their logic must be, I want to make a living at doing this. And if I'm going to make a back, backup tool that saves people, you know, their data... 50 bucks a machine a year isn't too bad. Yeah, right. And that's for the commercial license, I think. Yes, right, 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 right. Yeah, so, okay. I mean, that's definitely one we should have mentioned sooner on the show. It didn't make it because it wasn't, you know, immediately uh, one that we go to or one of the free ones, but it's definitely something I think I should add to the list of ones to try. It does look pretty neat. I mean, they've got some, like, charts here uh, on their GitHub page showing, like, what, uh, running time of backups, and they're comparing... Duplicacy to Restic and Borg and you know other things. Hmm. Uh, sounds like they, I don't know if it's out already, they've got some paper written about the internal workings. They talk about being a lockless backup. So I don't know, I haven't vetted any of that, but uh. sounds neat. Now guys, we've heard a lot about uh, suggestions and it sounds like, well, Wes hasn't said anything mysteriously, but Chris, at least you and I, it sounds like we need a new backup strategy. Do you think we should do a little bit of a challenge and each try one of the different suggestions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would be willing to give this a, how do you say it? I'm not sure. I just made it up, but I say duplicacy. Or duplicis, duplicy? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you say it however you want. Uh, <laughs> Whoever tries this one du gets uh, to decide. Duplicacy. Uh, no, uh, let's just. You want more than one case. I, I kind of feel like I might give it a go. I feel like I, I it's like three. I really want to try. I want to try auto restic with restic. I want to try uh, Borg with Borgmatic. Uh, but I, I also really like the idea of this overall feature set because it's got the web GUI, it's got the command line, it's got the ease of use aspect to it. It's got the simplicity where it's not dealing with this huge like remote back back end that I'm sending the data to. It's kind of checking all those boxes. So I'd be willing to give this one a go. I don't know about you, Wes. You have one you want to try that we've maybe yeah, have or haven't at, talked uh, about? Copia, K O P I A. Huh? Huh? Have we talked about that one yet? Is this no, another one we haven't talked about? It was a recommendation from uh, someone in our matrix room all right. when we were first talking about various backup situations. All right. All right. It bills itself as a fast and secure open source backup for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Encrypted, compressed, and duplicated backups using cloud storage that you pick. It also supports stuff like, you know, web dev and 
SFTP and so not, not we, we all should just back up to the cloud. next cloud server. <laughs> 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 all right. So you're going to try out this Copia K O P I A. I'm going to sure. try out the duplicate Casey. <laughs> duplicate Casey. <laughs> and then Brent, what do you want to try? What do you want to try? Well, Martin wrote in earlier saying that Borg with Vorta was super simple and worked really well. So I'm tempted by that. All right. That's. Uh, all right, go for it, Brent. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be great. <laughs> oh, I feel like maybe I made the wrong choice. I don't know. We'll see. Boost to Graham. All right. Well, we do have uh, some boosts to get to, so uh, let's jump into that. Uh, Bob the Nut boosted in with 75,000 sat boys. How about that? That's pretty great. Hey, rich uh, Bob writes, I finally, I finally managed to figure out this sats thing. Cheers. Thanks for the many years of great content. Your podcasts have provided hours and hours of entertainment, Linux, and education. Aww. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, I thought about this the other day, too. Is there are so many different ways to go about and get these sats, right? So uh, sats are the account of Bitcoin. 100 million sats is a Bitcoin. There's no actual Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin. There are 100 million sats. And back in the day, we were throwing around sats like they were worth a penny because they were, and you just threw around so many sats that you needed a way to account for a lot of them. So the community came up with Bitcoin. That's why the project's called Bitcoin, and then the amount is called Bitcoin. It's 100 million sats. And then how you get those, like with the Cash App, the Strike App, RoboSats, peer-to-peer, like there's all these ways, right? And depending on how you go about it, it can be a real bear. Um, but I'm really impressed with how many people like Bob persevere, because if we let that turn us away from adopting Linux so many years ago, or if we let that stop us from adopting Matrix in the last year, there's so many things that when we try them or when you're early to adopt something or when it's just the primitives are there, but the interface is still being built, so many things that are hard at first, but pay off in the long run. Sometimes those are our most powerful tools. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, Jay. D H Brown, J D H Brown, J D H Hot Brown. Yeah, okay, we got a little hot in there. All right, uh, boosting with twenty thousand sats. Hey guys, new Linux user here, and even shorter time listener. Thanks for making this infuriating journey kind of fun. <laughs> yes, that, that exactly. Yeah. The last point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> he says it's great to find you guys in here. I'm not the only one struggling from time to time. You help make the journey better. Well, that. My friend is great to see. If that ain't great motivation to keep showing up to this show. Yeah. Uh, user Eric the Red boosted in with 19,000 sats. A couple of episodes ago, Chris's breakdown of Garuda Linux, adding spoilers and turbos made my day. Love the show and the community. <laughs> hey, you know what? When I was a kid, I tried the uh, cards and the spokes of the bike to get the clicking noises. Yeah. Click, 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 it was click, cool click, for click, a while. Click. I loved it. I loved it. Thumbs boosted in with 10,000 sats. Love to the hidden gem at the end of episode 494. That's last episode. Chris played a treat for members after the stream. It's like the golden days of albums on CDs with hidden audio tracks. It's a great show as always. Love the coverage on Backup Solutions. If you make it to scale, I look forward to a meetup. When I was bummed, I was out of town for the West Coast tour. If you don't make it, I completely understand. Yeah, it's still... <clears throat> Ugh, it's still really touch and go because <laughs> all should be clear at some point as to what the issue is and why we haven't hawed like this. I think right now it's probably safe to assume we're not going to be there, which kills me because I'm still like laying up at night thinking, what if I just got in the car and I just drove really, really fast? <laughs> like, could I make it that, you know, like <laughs> I'm still doing all that. So like, I, I don't want to say it's not going to happen, but I don't, I just can't see it happening, especially once all has been made clear. As to which I cannot say what that is yet. But obviously, if I'm keeping it a secret, there's a reason and it's a big deal. But we'll see. We'll see. I can't say anything more. Note to self, don't give Chris secrets. The people that are listening right now that know what I'm talking about are going, that son of a bitch, shut up, shut up. That's what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> if it helps the audience, I don't even know what he's talking about. Scuba Steve boosted in with 5,000 sats. Hello, Chris, Wes, and Brent. I'd love to get an update on Brent's distro journey. Oh, my goodness. I've been revisiting Tumbleweed recently, and I'm really impressed with how solid the experience is. Weirdness of Yast aside, Brent, how's it going? Been a listener since 2015, and even all these years later, wow. Unplugged always goes to the top of my podcast queue. 
Thanks for keeping it going. Thank you, Scuba Steve. And I've also heard Scuba Steve boosting in some other uh, value for value shows. So you're a rock star, sir. Brett, how has Tumbleweed been going for you? And have you had to uh, deal with Yast in the day to day much? Well, it's funny. I, uh, Chris, as you know, I have this random Mac keyboard that I just happened to plop on this desk the other day for an unknown reason. And it has uh, the menu, like the super key reversed. So literally before the show today, I was like, oh, I'm going to go like see if I can maybe configure the keyboard to like switch those back to what I'm used to. And uh, so you hit keyboard in the KD menu and the Yast keyboard uh, configurer shows up along with the KD one, which I'm familiar with. And I was like, I'll, I'm just going to try it. And it was totally useless. Uh, <laughs> so I would say the, the more I try it, the less I want to try Yast features. But uh, sometimes they're good, I guess. That's the best I've did you Did you end up trying the Plasma one or did you just give up at that yeah, point? Yeah, I went back to the, tra- the Plasma one and it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is totally okay. logical and makes sense and doesn't ask me for my password just for some, like, totally useless screen. So... <laughs> Now, Brentley, though, are, are you doing your updates? Have you done any software management? How's that been going? Yeah, I've been doing updates uh, not as regularly as, say, an Arch user might, like six times a day, <laughs> uh-huh. but maybe every two weeks, which is probably pushing it for a rolling release, uh, at least from what I understand from my last experiences. But um, honestly, it's been totally smooth. I haven't run into any errors from the software side. Now, that being said, um, you heard me talk about my brother's computer earlier and how I, in the past, totally screwed things up and he has a failing hard drive. And we took that opportunity to put him on a new version of Linux for him. And you know what I chose? I chose chose Tumbleweed. And Uh one of the main reasons I chose it was the ButterFS support built in and the snapshotting and stuff. He loved the idea that every time he updates, he gets like a little... You know, something he can roll back to if something goes wrong. That's great. But we did run into the strangest issue, which maybe you two might have some ideas around this, or maybe the oh, audience. Gosh, is there like a is there a double bug field when it's Brent and his brother? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> dangerous. So I was like, you know, he sat beside me, and I'm in the cockpit, and I'm running, you know, installing this new you know tumbleweed for him, and he's all excited, right? But he's just watching. Is the me. cockpit code for the hot tub? Uh, I know you guys do yeah. a lot of stuff in yeah, the hot tub. That's fine. Like a little f- cute little like floaty desk yeah. situation. That'd be perfect. It has a floating cup holder too, so it works. And so everything was going great until we went to like do the first update. And then all the repos just complained about bad um, checksums. And I was like, that's the weirdest thing. I've not run into that. And I update all the time. And the only way I can solve it from all the research that I did was that it might have been a mirror issue, which seemed odd considering I hadn't run into that, you know, the whole many last months that I've been using this. But yeah. we did switch internet sources recently. And so I was like, huh, I was just going to say, I'm going to try on like my cell phone with Hotspot because it's a different provider than our sort of house internet. Sure enough, worked totally fine. And both my laptop and his new install ran into this problem with this new internet source that we have. So you're saying your new ISP is censoring Linux? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's kind of what I'm saying. And I was really (laughs) surprised. And I was like, is it just possible that like maybe it's a different mirror that's having an issue? And I tried a bunch of different mirrors, like kernel.org has a mirror that they they put out there and like all of them had the same issue. And so it has anyone else run into this? Because it was the weirdest thing. I mean, we have a small fix, but it doesn't seem like a sustainable one. So I'd be curious if anyone ran into that. But other than that, I mean, it does, everything's been great. It doesn't seem unheard of. It does seem rare, but it's not unheard of. I, I think there's got to be also some tooling in there to find new mirrors, if I seem to recall. So you could try getting a new set of... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did try that and uh, issue persist. Sounds like you might want a VPN on your... Uh... WAN connection at this rate. <laughs> God, yeah. Right? Huh. Jeff, you've had this happen on Ubuntu? Yeah, ages ago. I think it was 18.04 on only one installation. And multiple installations in the house, but one specific computer would do exactly what he's talking about and had to use my hotspot to get around it. Weird. Is it a, do you think it's a routing issue? Is it a DNS issue? Like, what is going on there? No idea. <laughs> and the error message was cryptic but helpful. Like, it, it, it suggested you know, a bad mismatch of signatures for a specific package. And it said, you know, 
this could be a real issue. So don't don't run this thing, but we'll let you if you really want to, right? And uh, and so of course we aborted all that stuff, but it just was like the strangest thing. You know, I wonder if we could do enough digging here so you could find like exactly which signatures or checksums, like, and then go check and see like, all right, if I download the same link, different connections, are you actually, are you getting, are the files different? Are the checksums different? What's, what, if anything, is changing? Is some ISP fooling around with your traffic? Yeah, I know. I think there's something here. It might be the next episode or something. Is, is someone, is someone mm. at SUSE trolling Brent? <laughs> this, would, this would happen to Brent, right? Like, <laughs> right. been using Linux for 20 plus years, never had this problem. <laughs> yeah. Brent, though, he's a privacy-minded guy. Oh, he always God. finds the bugs, and he ends up not only with a buggy situation, but potentially a privacy-hostile ISP. Like, so, like, ig- ignoring that particular situation <laughs> that we literally yeah. ran into, like, two days uh-huh. ago, everything's been great. I uh, have nothing to report. That's bad. No, that's good. So I think um, we're just going to keep going, and I think we'll revisit it. Have you have you mostly been getting like new software from the repos, from Flatpak, from you bootstrap Snap on there? It's been a real mix. Uh, I have been using Ansible to configure these things, which is why it was so easy to do with my brother because I was like literally just copy the same the same stuff over. But it's a mix of repo stuff and uh, Flatpaks. Um, I don't think I have any snaps installed this time around. So that's a new thing for me. And uh, it's been mostly great. Element crashes randomly. I don't know why. But <laughs> other than that, uh, my experience with the whole Flatpak ecosystem has been fairly good. Yeah. Echo that. Jeff, Jeff of the Jungle boosted in with 10,000 sats. Coming in hot with the boost. <laughs> First time boosting through my Albi wallet. I wanted to let you know that you can also fund your Albi wallet through Robinhood if you have Bitcoin over there. Oh. Handy. That <laughs> is. Uh, that's another big user base. Keep up the great content. Forward humor boosted in with 5,555 sets. Really enjoyed all the backup recommendations. Very responsible addition to all the self-hosting content. I also loved hearing about the service with the uh, dead man functionality to notify if it has not received any new content lately. For those of us who might not monitor home infrastructure quite like we do our work infrastructure... That could really prevent a disaster. Yeah, no kidding. That's one of the things, you know, if it's like, I'm happy to pay for it. That's, what I do. that's a real value add. Uh, and if you do it right, it doesn't have to be a big, huge compromise. Ah, that's uh, some great feedback. Thank you, sir. Vectron boosts in with lead sets. Why is nobody talking about duplicity for backups? It's simple to use from a shell script and supports a lot of backends. I.e. S3 Glacier low-cost gold storage. It's pretty basic, but easy to use for disaster recovery and used by the Deja Dupe desktop app that's from Linux Mint, if I recall correctly, and also included in Manjaro's GNOME edition. It's got compression and encryption. No server component needed. Yeah, and it sure supports a ton of back-end storage. I mean, you pick whatever cloud service you might possibly want, including just generic web dev and, of course, SCP. This is tricky because like we have a real problem when we start talking about all these backup tools that have the same basic names, it becomes really Ooh. unclear which one we're even talking about. Like it's now I get this one mixed up with the one we just mentioned, but it, these are good, uh, great tooling. And so we will link to it in the show notes. And of course it'll be a little more clear when you can see it all there in the notes. Sir lurks a lot boosts in with another set of lead sets. Restic is not the only one with Vorta and Borg. It's also super easy to mount your remote backups from the server to your local machine and peruse them with your desktop file manager. Or Midnight Commander, if that's your jam. Yes! Midnight Commander shout out for the win! Love, MC! But Lurks kept going with another round of lead sets. While I love Borg as my primary backup solution, it still feels like putting my data into a database or something. I worry if things go sideways that I might not be able to easily recover my data. Maybe that's unfounded? Not sure. In any case, if one is none, two is one, and you need three copies to really be redundant <laughs> and reliable, yep. I feel like my third should be both remote and maybe using a different tech stack. Mm. What might be a good choice that's incremental, does deduplication, and isn't Borg? This is, so I kind of agree with Lurk's entire thing here about going too complicated makes it feeling like the tooling could fail you and leave you without your proper backups. 
But also, if you do think of one as none, two as one, and three as a backup, I kind of like the idea of using a different stack for that third mm-hmm. backup. And I wonder if when we all try our different tooling, if maybe there might be some pairing of the two that might end up. Because that's a great point. Yeah, it's a little more complicated, but yeah. I mean, you get you know you get a lot of diversity there. And if there's a if there's a bad bug, well, hopefully some protection. Leet text boosted in with four hundred and forty four sats. Row of sitting guys. <laughs> okay, all right. A not so long time listener, second time booster here, decided to send some of the sats I've earned from Fountain. I decided to try micro text editor because you talked about it in the Tuxies honorable mentions, and I'm loving it. It's the best text editor I've ever used. It's easy to use and configure, and uh, I even got Rust Analyzer working after some tinkering. And it's GIF, GIF, greetings from the land of Linus Torvalds. Try pronouncing that in Finnish. We've experimented. We've practiced. I don't know if anybody wants to embarrass themselves today. We tried, uh, just for LAN recently, we were debating the pronunciation of Linus versus Linus or Linus. and But Linus just says Linus, so we just kind of go with the way Linus says it. Yeah, just uh, random, unrelated, but uh, Micro is packaged in Nix packages. <laughs> this point, I'm just checking on basically anything we mentioned, because, you know, why not? Yeah, it's surprisingly good hit rate, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Sir Lurkslot came in again with 13,370 sats. Woof. That Thank name you, is appropriate. Lurking around indeed. I, and I hear him on other uh, value for value shows as well. Now, he wants to put forth a new pronunciation for WireGuard. He says, henceforth, WireGuard shall be known as Wire Gargle unless another boost raises the sats bar. <laughs> now, starting in the new year, you have to have one confirming boost, right? So All right. So we've got this up. As an option, but we need Wire someone to Wire Gargle second. is available as a new official pronunciation on the show, but it has to be a confirmed second by somebody in the audience. And then it requires a large boost to, to remove it from the pronunciation lexicon. This is because, uh, who's to really say how any of this is made up? It's all made up. Who's to say how it's pronounced? So, you get to pick. Uh, Real Sidium boosted in. He said, this is another kind of lower boost, but I wanted to pull it forward because they've been listening since 2021. And they got a bit sick of the boost talk and the Bitcoin stuff, although I liked the message content of the boost, they said. I think that's a nice clarification. Appreciate that. But you know what? They say, I finally threw in the towel and went back and listened to We Hate Crypto 2. And I'm on board. That was in, that was episode nine of Office Hours. You've been doing this for a long time. And uh, if you say it's the way to go, I really can't argue with that. And I think even if I hated it still and you had been wrong, there's just no joy in me having to say I told you so anyways. So I downloaded Fountain, and here's all of the sats I have earned over the last week. But I have to say, I am throwing in the towel on Fountain. It's just not as polished as Pocket Cast, at least not on iOS, and it consistently forgets where I was at. Oh, that, that would be sucks. frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair. Fair. <laughs> that, yeah, that would suck. Uh, which just doesn't do it for me. So there are here are all my sats I've earned over the last week. It ain't much, but it's honest work. Are there any podcasting 2.0 apps you'd recommend? I just don't think I can go back to a 1.0 app again. <laughs> I, I totally know what you mean. I, I have to say, uh, it took me a while to move over because Pocket Cast and apps like Overcast and, you know, Podcast Addict and uh, AntennaPod, they've been around forever, man. Yeah, they really have. Years and years of polish. And these podcasting 2.0 apps, they're like, you know, new compared to that. And they're moving quick. And so... I kind of like getting in on that action sometimes when when something is kind of trending up and taking off. It is kind of tricky, though, as you say, right? Like, because a lot of these apps that they exist to explore and you know improve and implement some of these podcasting two point things, as well as just being a podcast client, of course. But maybe that means that's where your attention and focus is, at least at first, instead of like a really you know nuanced implementation of some of the basic one point features. It was also interesting moving to Android and seeing these apps work a little differently. Oh yeah, a little more bugs sometimes. Uh-huh. Just saying. But real, the stack that's worked for me really well so far is Podverse and Albi. Podverse is just continuing to produce one great update after another, really getting there. I love the web UI and the fact that I can finish the episodes at my desk. But the thing that I think is really fantastic about it is it uses Albi for its boost wallet integration. And Albi you take with you wherever you want to go. You can boost from the web. You can tie it into other apps like uh, when Pocket Cast does get boost support, they'll probably do Albi integration, right? When AntennaPod does boost support, they're going to use Albi. 
because it's kind of a universal wallet that can use your own node or you can use their services. So it's a little more flexible in that regard. I think people like it a little bit more. I think it, it, because they're not, they're not trapped to one app necessarily. And the way I think about this is these apps have these little, these little wallet components. You throw a few bucks in there, right? It's, you don't want to throw like hundreds of dollars in there. You throw a few bucks in there that you're boosting people with. Like I, I, you know, I keep like a couple hundred sats in there. Yeah, you just kind of load it up so that as you listen or as you want to react or send in some feedback, you've yeah. got it available, right? And just top it up when you need to. And Alba, you can top off on the web. Yeah. So you don't have to do it from the phone, which is kind of nice. That's, I've, I've been enjoying that a lot. Kind of, you can do your management there. And then, you know, it's just like when you show up to the phone, it's already there. Woodcarver came in with 13,303 sats. I don't care about the speculation part of crypto, but I'm finding some real life use cases for the Bitcoin and the sats, and I'm having a ton of fun. I'm paying for my VPN and writing sats on ju as just two examples. <laughs> Let's try enjoy ourselves. <laughs> I like that. Let's just enjoy ourselves and eventually people are going to want to join it. I agree. It is a lot of fun. Um, we had a really good showing today from new listeners who decided to get on the boost bandwagon. I mean, if you go through that, a lot of those were from first timers. Thank you, everybody. That's really awesome. This episode has really kind of been made for you, too. Uh, we don't do this very often, so this is it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Take it in while um, can. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we also have been seeing an uptick in people just streaming sats without any message. They're just streaming while they listen. Thank you. That's really been awesome, too. It's Love it. Really neat to see that. Um, and been hearing a lot of familiar names on the other Value for Value shows out there. So it's great to see you out there supporting the network and helping everybody on the podcasting 2.0 bandwagon. You can get a new podcast app that supports Boost at newpodcastapps.com or go to Get Albi and just get the Albi browser extension, nice little piece of open source software. And then you don't got to switch podcast apps. You know, if you want to stick with your pocket cast, you just go get Albi and you boost from the podcast index website. Boom, take care of it. You just find Linux unplugged over there. And once you have Albi set up, you can boost right from the web page. It's real slick. That's how I've been doing it. And that's another reason I like Albi and Podverse is because it's the same sats. If I'm on the web or if I'm in the player and I'm actually listening to the podcast and I want to boost right in the moment, it's the same stash of sats. And that's nice. We got a really fun pick. You might have seen this one going around on the web if uh, you're following these things closely, but you might have missed it. And uh, Wes wanted to bring it to our attention because it's just too much darn fun. Carbonyl is a Chromium-based browser. Yeah, I know. We have a lot of those. But this one, well, it's built to run in a terminal. What? Yeah. It supports pretty much all web APIs, including WebGL, WebGPU, audio and video playback, animations, etc. It's snappy, starts in less than a second, runs at 60 FPS, and idles at about 0% CPU <laughs> usage. <laughs> okay. It does not require a Windows server, i.e. works in a safe mode console, and even runs wow. through SSH. And you actually can look at the graphics of a web page in the terminal? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's not super crisp because it's a terminal. Right. But it makes links seem like, like you know, history. So basic. And it also is a great way to just make, turn your website into an 8-bit art style thing. Because this basically <laughs> kind of looks like 8-bit art. <laughs> yeah. I don't know exactly what I would use this for, if anything, but it's it's really a neat idea. It's cool to see implemented this sharply and it's packaged up in Docker. So if you want to just give it a try, there's a Docker one-liner on their GitHub. If you have Docker installed, it'll just boot up with your favorite website or try it at jupiterbroadcasting.com because, hey, that one looks pretty sharp in there. Yeah, when I read this first time, I read it as Chernobyl. <laughs> 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 no, Carbonyl, right? Carbonyl. Carbonyl, because it's like for your terminal. Carbonyl. We'll have a link to it. Don't worry about how you say it. We'll just have a link to the GitHub. Nice little find there, Wes. I did see that floating around. And I thought, why would I want to have Chernobyl in my terminal? That doesn't make any sense. But turns out, you do. I do. All right, boys. Anything else we want to talk about today? Are we all done here? I think we are. I think our business is done. If uh, you want to get to anything we talked about, the links are at linuxunplugged.com slash 495. We do have the Linux Unplugged website. Lots of resources, RSS feed, some mumble info, probably all kinds of things we forget about up there. Go find out. Yeah, tell us what you found over there. Let us know. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station. Yep, and we will be live on a Sunday. Wait, no. But it'll be a different live time, but we'll have it at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. We will not be live next Sunday. But what you want to do anyway is um, hit refresh on your feed constantly. Yeah, it'll just drop. Or just keep the jupiter.tube page open and then boom, all of a sudden live stream. You know, or jupiterbroadcasting.com slash live, boom, all of a sudden live stream. 
I don't know. I mean, who knows? That's the most exciting way. We don't even know at this point. But we do know we won't be here on Sunday. We're taking one week off, but we will have an episode for you. So it'll be in your feeds. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Unplugged program. And you know what? We appreciate you. And we'll see you right back here next Sunday. <laughs>